uh, that you're that you're not seeing, right? So, first of all, just a little fun start. This is a earthquake that happened last year, 2019, uh, out in California. Actually, a series of earthquakes, magnitude oh, six and magnitude seven. It's going to come down in the yeah. studio here, and it is going for uh, quite a bit, everybody. Experiencing very strong shaking. Wow. I think we need to get under the desk. All right, we're going to go to break. Uh, we'll, we'll be, be right, right back. back. We'll be right this. back. Wow. Holy. Okay, can you imagine being on that roller coaster during an earthquake? I think everybody needed a new pair of pants after that. It's still shaking. It's still shaking. This is my favorite part here. First, though, we want to get to Southern California. All right, let's see here. So that's kind of what I want to show you. That was, uh, again, uh, last year, uh, 2019, uh, in California. Um, I did link that one. It is linked under uh, uh, videos for this week as well. Um, so if you want to share with your friends. But uh, I'm just kind of, you know, I mean, scary, yeah, right? Um, uh, but, uh, you know, I don't remember really here even getting any deaths. Yeah, there was some damage, but, uh, but not a lot of death associated with that, which is surprising because you know, that was like a, a magnitude 7.1 earthquake and we'll see a, another 7.1 earthquake later today that will, will be a little bit different but uh, one of the things I'll kind of keep harping back on um, in this uh, when we talk about earthquakes um, is a uh, is a mitigation well actually throughout all of these natural disasters one of the big things we'll be discussing is mitigation or or how do we buffer or dampen or mitigate the effects that these natural disasters have on us as a, as a human population and society, right? Um, but for earthquakes, one of the huge mitigation techniques or, or things used uh, that can be employed are building codes. Uh, obviously, California has pretty strong building codes. Japan, pretty strong building codes. Um, uh, Peru, actually pretty strong building codes as well. Um, but, you know, other places around the earth do not have such strong building codes, you know, Haiti, Mexico City, stuff like that. And we'll see uh, what a difference that those can make uh, kind of later today here. But uh, uh, what we did, you know, so California earthquake, 7.1 magnitude on the Richter scale. So that's a pretty large quake, right? Now, last chapter uh, in the videos, you saw uh, the, uh, the relationship between the distribution of earthquakes uh, and volcanoes uh, related to plate tectonics. Now, here are just the earthquakes uh, shown. Uh, and you can see with just plotting the earthquakes, uh, you know, you can see pretty much that these delineate all of the different 
tectonic plates that we have, not the, even just the large ones like the African plate here, but we can even see small ones like the Cocos plate and the Nazca plate, stuff like that here too, right? Uh, look in the Mediterranean, you can see this is just, there's all sorts of craziness going on in there, right? But here is our Pacific ring of fire. You'll notice that, you know, this is where we would see all those, those large active volcanoes as well. Uh, but we see lots and lots of earthquakes along our ring of fire as well. So distribution of earthquakes, how do they relate to plate tectonics? Yes, they relate to plate tectonics. They occur and actually delineate or demarcate or mark uh, the boundaries between our, our large tectonic plates. So they occur at plate boundaries. What type of plate boundaries? Every single one of them, right? So convergent boundaries, whether we're talking subduction or we're talking continental, continental smashing, you're gonna have large earthquakes here as a continental, continental smashing. India into Asia, creating the Himalayan mountains. Those again are still rising today. That collision is still occurring. It started 35 million years ago and it's still happening today. So that should tell you what extreme forces and masses we're dealing with when we're talking plate tectonics. So we have them at convergent boundaries, at divergent boundaries, right, where things are coming apart. Yes, we do have earthquakes, but generally they're not going to be as strong, right? So if you think about it as we start to talk about earthquakes and how earthquake works, right, when we have any kind of convergent boundary of things coming together, there is a lot of friction, a lot of smashing going on, right? That is obviously going to generate lots of earthquakes. Uh, at divergent margins, right, we're pulling things apart, new new crust is being created as it, as it rises from the mantle. But, but still, as we pull these apart, we do get earthquakes. They just generally are not going to be nearly as large uh, as the earthquakes that we see at convergent boundaries and transform boundaries, right, sliding past each other. The most famous transform boundary in the world right here, the San Andreas Fault, right, it's just sliding slowly past itself right and we know because you know it's our, our california quake that started the uh, the 7.1 magnitude earthquake uh last year um and we know from previous earthquakes that those can be large and devastating as well as whenever you have hard rock solid rock on solid rock just grinding that's when you have potentials for these large earthquakes so here is uh, is one example this is the uh I think the Loma Prieta earthquake in, in California in the 1980s. Uh, you can see what happened here. They had this double-decker highway that literally just, whoops, wrong button, that literally just, just smacked one layer on top of the other. Uh, killed nearly 100 people, I believe, which is amazing. It didn't, didn't kill many, many more people because we're talking about know, packed highway cities here. So um, what is an earthquake, right? So technically, an earthquake is a shaking or vibration of the ground. So when you're standing there on the street corner and that large truck rumbles by you and you can feel the vibrations in the ground, is that an earthquake? Well, yes, technically, but it's not the kind we're, we're interested in, in here today, right? The kind we're interested in have to do with geological movements, right? So sudden movements, or breaks along a fault. And remember now a fault is um, uh, a break in, in the rock itself along which movement occurs, right? So we have normal faults, reverse faults, and then strike slip faults. And we discussed these last chapter a little bit and they accommodate, you know, the space issues. So, so uh, reverse faults uh, occur with, uh, you know, compaction or, and, and, and compression and they accommodate the issue that there's not enough space. So things are gonna to have to shorten and thicken to, uh, to accommodate that, right? So uh, along these faults, this is where the earthquakes occur, right? Movement on those faults or sudden slippage uh, causes ground vibrations. Those then, you know, vibrate and extend through the earth uh, and, and result as an earthquake, right? They are most common along plate boundaries, as I just showed you. In fact, they, they mark the plate boundaries, the differences between our, all of our major and minor plates. Um, but uh, they don't uh, exclusively occur uh, at plate boundaries, right? So 
They can also occur uh, within volcanoes or with volcanic eruptions can start off earthquakes as well, right? Or um, even nuclear tests can start off an earthquake that we can pick up uh, on uh, on our earthquake machines, our, our um, uh, uh, seismograms that we'll, we'll talk about later here. Um, so, but most common along plate boundaries, but not not necessarily linked to that. There are there are old faults in our Earth that can become reactivated, um, and uh, we've seen this a little bit with with fracking, uh, injecting high pressure fluids into the Earth has sometimes reactivated and caused slippage along some of these old faults, uh, which will again will generate an earthquake. Right? But the vast majority occur uh, at our plate boundaries, right? So back to stress and strain, we discussed this a little bit last chapter. We'll, uh, we'll keep, uh, keep uh, our discussion going on that here. So rocks at plate boundaries, obviously they are under stress. And the stress again is a force per unit area. So pounds per square inch, right? You want your tires inflated to the proper stress so you can drive down the road, right? Um, and we have all different types of stresses. We have, you know, compressional, tensional and shear stress that that activate or work in in our earth and that's what we're dealing with when we're talking about earthquakes as well right so as the stress builds up right so stress is a force per unit area uh the the rock starts to build up strain and now what strain is it's essentially stored energy from from the just basically this stored stress so it's, it's a potential energy right uh, and then they, they tend to deform. So strain and deformation refer to, you know, that, that buildup of energy and, and change of shape of the rock itself. So as things start to move past each other, right, they might not, they're not moving. There's a lot of friction in there, but they're building up lots of strain and storing up this energy, right? At some point, the strain exceeds you know, the strength of the rock itself, and when it exceeds the strength of the rock, uh, the rock is going to do what we call fail or break, right? And this is going to release that, that strain, that stored energy as vibration throughout the earth, and we get an earthquake, right? So as this stress builds up, things start to deform, right? And strain builds up, and then they snap and release that energy, and that is when we get an earthquake. So to discuss earthquakes here, um, the, the, the theory that we, we are, are currently running with is known as what's elastic rebound theory. And the idea here is uh, after the rock breaks, right, it builds up this strain, right, stores that energy. But after the rock breaks, right, it, it returns to it, it's basically its original undeformed shape. So, uh, efficiently basically to transmit uh, most seismic energy, you know, waves, uh, we, we must have a material that has elastic properties or the ability to bounce back. Now, what do I mean by that? We'll take a look here at this, this uh, example of a stick, right? So here's our original stick, right? Now we've added stress to it and the, the stick is building up strain and starting to bend, right? Uh, and then we exceed the ability of that, we exceed the strength of that stick, and it ruptures. But now we're not stuck with two, you know, bent broken halves of stick. We're stuck with two straight halves of stick uh, because they have snapped back elastically to their original position. So let me show you that here. I've got my live stick demo. Let me make sure I can. All right, here's my live stick demo, right? No, actually, I should probably here. Um, let's see. All right. My stick demo is not working because I have my background on. Hold on a second here. Stop sharing screen. No. Okay. All right. So that was screwing up my, uh, my stick demo. All right. Here's my stick, right? So here's the idea. We have a stick and this nice straight um, uh, stick here. As I start to add stress to it, it starts to build up strain, right? And it starts to bend and deform, right? So there's the original stick. It starts to bend and deform. And this one actually I can bend it fairly far. But eventually I reach a point where I exceed 
the ability of that of this stick, the strength of the stick, uh, with this with the amount of strain that I've caused. And I, wow, <laughs> this is really bendy. Anyway, so let me get a snap. Right, so there will be our earthquake. Right during that snap, you can actually feel the vibrations in there. But now I'm not stuck with two. Uh, if I rip them off here, I'm not stuck with two very bent halves of stick. I'm stuck with two straight pieces of stick because the stick again it bounced back or elastically rebounded to its original position so let's try that again here so straight stick right bend 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 snap right and then now i have two straight halves of stick because again they jumped back into position all right hopefully my little live demo there helped uh, I have another one here to show you. This is just a little, um, what? But I just changed that. Uh, fine. Oh, uh, don't know where my demo went. Um, let's see if I can locate it here. YouTube. Oh, there it is. Ah, oh, beautiful. Okay. So here's what it would look like. All right. Can everybody see the video here? Holler if not. Um, so here's here's that, that same uh, idea demonstrated on uh, a strike slip fault. So this would be like our San Andreas fault. So we're looking down on top of the earth, here's a road, these are trees, right? And we start to, uh, to um, uh, uh, add some stress here, it's gonna start to strain uh, our, our, our uh, geology here, which we can see when we look at this nice straight road here, as we start to add that strain, it starts to deform. Eventually, we exceed the ability of the rock to take that strength and it snaps, right? But now we're stuck with two straight pieces of road again because the earth you know has that elastic potential again so it's going to snap back into its original shape let's uh do this one more time here just to make sure so straight piece of road right building up strain building up strain building up strain getting too much strain and snap and now it elastically rebounded into its original uh, straight position. All right. So hopefully that gives you an idea of the kind of theory that uh, that we 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 uh, we are using with earthquakes at the moment. Here. So, um, again, that is elastic rebound theory. It's our it's our our, our theory for how uh, earthquakes operate. So again, uh, no elastic potential, no earthquake. So take a piece of taffy or Play-Doh, neither of which I could find this morning, uh, and try to cause an earthquake, and that is simply not going to happen. It's just going to right? Because it has no elastic potential, no want to rebound into its original position. It doesn't build up that strain, uh, so it doesn't, doesn't rebound, right? A couple important definitions when we're talking about earthquakes here. First of all, the focus, the focus of an earthquake... Uh, is the point of actual rupper, rupture where that where that uh, the the slippage occurred where you know that strain built up so much that that you know it caused that that failure. Uh, that is the focus of the earthquake, and generally it is underground, fairly deep underground, right? Um, however, the epicenter, which is uh, what we're more familiar with when we're talking about earthquakes, you know, where was the epicenter of the earthquake? The epicenter was, you know, the earthquake was centered right on, you know, downtown Los Angeles or whatever, right? That is the epicenter of the earthquake. And that is taking that focus and projecting it straight up to the surface of the earth. So if you were to look from the epicenter straight down, there would be the focus of the uh of the earthquake and and why do we care about an epicenter well it's the spot on the surface of the earth that is closest to the focus 
and therefore is going to experience the most intense effects of the earthquake, ground shaking, energy release, all that kind of stuff, right? So moving away from here, right? Thinking of this as a, as a point underground, right? Moving away from here, kind of concentrically, we're getting a little farther and a little farther and a little farther away from that, that epicenter and the, the feeling, you know, and the intensity of the earthquake it was going to be less and less and less the, the further and further away you are from the epicenter. So uh, if you are the poor soul whose house is right at the epicenter of that earthquake, you will experience the most, you know, intense shake. Your, your town is right at the epicenter of the earthquake, right? The town, you know, 20 miles away from you is definitely still going to feel it, but it's not going to be as intense as it is right where, right where you are at the epicenter, right? So now that we know what causes an earthquake, right, we have that elastic potential and that snaps, right, and releases that energy as vibrations, and it releases it as vibrations called seismic waves. Now, we have three different types of seismic waves, um, and uh, they, they act in, in, in three different types of, of manners as well. So the first one that we have is the P wave or primary wave, P wave, primary wave. This is the fastest wave, right? It actually, it acts as kind of an extension and compression, uh, but it travels the fastest through our earth. Then we have the secondary wave, which would be this guy here, right? Secondary wave uh, also travels through our earth, uh, but it's a little slower then the primary wave, so wherever you are, it arrives after the primary wave, so it arrives second. So it is the secondary wave, right? So primary wave, right? P wave, S wave, secondary wave, um, also known as a shear wave. We'll always, always start with an S, right? Uh, so first one to arrive is the primary wave. Secondary one is the second one to arise. These both travel through our Earth, uh, but then the third type of wave does not. It travels across the surface of our Earth, and those are known as L waves, right? So those are generated after the P and the S waves arrive at the surface of the Earth. Then from the surface, these, these L waves are generated, also called long waves or surface waves. So the first to arrive is the P wave. Second to arrive is the S wave, and the third to arrive is the L wave, or primary, secondary, last, if that's the way you want to think about them. And we have a couple different types of those, uh, those L waves that we shall discuss here. Right? But uh, let's look at these kind of individually. So there again, primary wave arrives first. Secondary wave arrives second, travels slower, right? Because it travels slower, right? The farther you are away from the earthquake, since that the first one was traveling faster, the second one was traveling slower, it lags farther and farther behind as you travel. So the farther you away are, are from the, the epicenter focus of the earthquake, uh, the longer interval of time between the arrival between the primary wave and the secondary wave, right? And then we have the, the L waves, the long waves, the last waves. Those arrive again at the, uh, um, uh, uh, basically radiate out from the epicenter. So, first of these waves, P waves, right? These are kind of analogous to sound waves. They work by extension and compression of material, right? These are very low amplitude and cause not too much property damage. I have my little uh, slinky demonstrator here, which I'm gonna try to, uh, to demonstrate these different waves for you. So if I can, let me demonstrate a P wave, again, extension and compression. So, right, it's traveling back and forth in this direction like that, right? So it basically it starts at one end and shoots it, oops, shoots it going towards the other end, right? So extension and compression, this is how sound waves travel, right? So, boing, right, and then that, that back and forth, that is, that is a P wave, right? Um, these can travel through solid, liquid, and gas, so P waves can travel through through all of those, right? Uh, but again, not much not much ground shaking or vibration, you know, in, in a little bit, right? Uh, but these are 
uh, are going to cause the least amount of property damage of the three different types of waves. But remember, again, they are the first to arrive, right? So the first thing you feel is kind of, oh, what's going on, right? And then lagging behind the P waves, they travel a little slower, right? So the P waves travel fast, right? The, the S wave a little slower. The farther you are, like, you know, if you're a little bit slower than your friend at running, right? The farther the race goes, the farther and farther ahead they get of you, right? Or farther and farther you lag behind, shall I say, right? Same thing is true with the S waves. They travel a little bit slower than the P waves, or also known as shear waves. Um, and they arrive second at any location, right? So the farther away the focus of the earthquake, again, you know, that your friend who's running faster than you, they're the P wave, you're the S wave. So if you go at the same speeds, you know, the farther you are or the farther you have to run, right, the farther you're going to lag behind. So the farther you are away from the source of the earthquake, the longer it will be between the arrival of the P wave and the arrival of the S wave or secondary wave, right? Also known as shear waves. Um, these, however, unlike the P waves, cannot travel through air or water because neither of them has shear strength, right? But uh, the damage they do is, is like this, right? So it's more like a, a sine wave, right? So yeah, my psyche is kind of crappy, but, but this, there we go. Up and down, there we go. Particle motion, up and down, right? So this is uh, an S wave. And as, as you can see, just by my little ridiculous demonstration here, it causes a lot more uh, ground vibration, right? A lot more motion and a lot more property damage uh, than the, the primary wave. So primary wave, you kind of feel this, uh, and then the secondary wave arrives and you're going up and down, right? Uh, and then the third group of waves are L waves or surface waves, right? L waves, last waves, right? These uh, generate, again, they, they travel across the surface of the Earth, so they originate at the epicenter and travel out from there, right? Uh, and these produce large amounts of displacement. These are the most destructive of your earthquake waves, especially if you're, you're at the epicenter or close by, right? Um, and they the reason they cause this is because the ground is trying to do several different things at once, right? So we have a couple different uh, types. First, we have our love waves, right? So these are all these are all L waves or last waves to to arrive, right, or, or to show up. Um, love waves, you know. So so we had the uh, the S wave kind of went like this up and down. The love waves go side to side, back and forth. So the same kind of motion, but side to side, right? And you know, if you were this highway here, that wouldn't be very good for you if things going side to side, right? Um, and then the Rayleigh wave, uh, the, the second kind of, of uh, L wave or surface wave that we have, uh, this one actually produces um, essentially, let me get this to, to work for me here. Um, all right. Essentially a rolling motion. So it produces a lot like kind of um, uh, an ocean wave works. It's an up and down and back and forth rolling motion, right? So this is our this is our Rayleigh wave, and as you can imagine, that doesn't do very good. So uh, going over our waves again, first we have our primary wave, which is our extension and compression. Travels the fastest, right? Causes the least amount of damage, least amount of ground vibration. Then we have our S waves, or secondary waves. Those are you know, shear waves as well, right? We can see quite a bit more ground vibration there, right? And that up and down motion, right? And then we have our surface waves, our last waves to arrive, and they cause the most destruction. First of all, we have our L waves, side to side motion, right? And then we have our Rayleigh waves, and we go, oh, right? So these are the ones that do the most damage, right? 